Seahawks fans, wherever you may be. Thanks for listening to the show. Join your hosts, Bill Alfstead and Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Hey, hi, Seahawks fans. Welcome back to another episode of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alfstead, sitting down with co-host Keith Myers, here to talk Seahawks football. We are in training camp. We're going to give you a training camp update, uh, our first one of the season. After uh, training camp began a couple of days ago, the team has had two practices, two full days, one where fans were able to go. I think all of the season ticket holders were able to go to the first uh, training camp session. The second one was not open to the public, uh, but we've got the reports and here to talk about it. Welcome in, Keith. How you doing? Doing good. Uh, yeah, it's... Um... I'm glad to be talking about football and actually what's going on on a field and not like, you know, speculation. This is, um, it's good to see guys out in pads and, and, and doing their thing. So actually they're not even in pads yet. They're in shells. Um, the pads won't come till next week, but, uh, still got some reports on, on how guys are doing and, and got some injury updates and should be a fun show. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of news to talk about. It is fun. It's always fun to talk uh, Seahawks football with you. And uh, this is our eighth camp covering this thing together. Uh, before that, of course, we paid attention. You were writing about it on uh, on Twelfth Man Rising um, for a few years there uh, before we we hooked up. And um, what talk to me first about your impression of training camp under Pete Carroll and what you're seeing that might be different under Mike McDonald. Well, the big thing. Um that I'm seeing and, and, and reading about is it's just different. Um, Pete Carroll was a lot about, you know, trying to make sure the energy was there and, and getting everyone like just pumped up and, and, and keeping everyone, um, you know, just flying around and, and, and playing with high energy. Um, Mike McDonald isn't about that. He's about attention to detail and not making mistakes. And it seems a little weird for them to be doing that this early in the process because usually it's one of those things where you start um you know you just get stuff installed get people going and then you start um you know tightening all that stuff up but he's just going in from the beginning and just being like nah we don't make mistakes um and in the scrimmage part of the first practice there was one procedural drill um so yeah he's gonna he has a Th- that attention to detail, that level of, of discipline is going to be uh, expected. And I'm kind of looking forward to seeing how this works out because yeah. that's one of the things that's been really frustrating um, for the last 14 years is all the penalties that mm-hmm. happened in a Pete Carroll team. Errors, right? Yeah. <clears throat> not understanding so. responsibilities, not understanding what other teammates are supposed to be doing, all of that, mm-hmm. really. It's yeah. a wholesale change, and it was noted notable for uh, a lot of folks that were there covering the team and, and so forth. That that was really the kind of the stark difference. Music was still there, but it was turned down about seventy five percent, so that you could hear the instruction and the communication between players was clear. Um, <clears throat> and that, to me, is uh, is a is a nice change, really. I mean, mm-hmm. I get the whole have fun aspect of it, play loose um keep the keep the energy up but there's no reason these guys can't do that still especially on game day um but with a brand new scheme brand new coaching staff new way of doing things it doesn't surprise me that things are a little bit different and i'm kind of uh yeah as you are looking forward to figuring out how that translates onto the field <clears throat> excuse me um so let's talk about a few things a few notes of interest i've yeah, i've got quite a list and I'll just go from from the things that we're just finding out about this morning to things that we've learned in the last few days. Um, Seahawks worked out former second round draft pick of the Seahawks, Marquise Blair, which I thought mm-hmm. was interesting. Still looking at, at players to kind of come in. He was out of football in 2023, so he's just trying to figure it out, I guess, and, and come back. He's been trying to figure it out since 2019. I thought, he was on, I thought he was on Philly's practice squad for at least part of the season. Maybe, um, no, not, but, not but regular season play. game appearance, right? Yeah, he never he never appeared in the game. Um, but yeah, he's a second round pick. Um, looked really good 
when he got opportunities to be on the field, but all those opportunities ended in injury. And that was really frustrating. And then, um, you know, we, in 2022, there just wasn't really a spot for him because the CX had their safeties and, you know, both their um, two starters and the high, high paid stars, at least they thought they were. And then, um, you know, younger backups and all of that. And so they let him go. Um, so he could go find another job and then things just haven't really worked out for him. So now he's back at least getting worked out, trying to show he's healthy. Yeah. No, uh, intimate signing there. Uh, Seahawks signed uh, wide receiver, Ty Scott, formerly in the USF or UFL. I was going to mm-hmm. say USFL. Um, and, uh, just, just more looking at more players, you know, I mm-hmm. think, you know, at this point, obviously I, and we can talk about the roster a little bit uh, as we move forward in this conversation, but, at this point, I think they're looking for practice squad level kind of players that um, they could keep around on the roster for a while, some future guys that they want to look at. Um, it'd be very surprising if a guy like Ty Scott emerged in preseason and made the roster. Um, that yeah. would just be like the uh, underdog story of the year. But um, it's always nice to have that influx come in. And then uh, in doing so, they released second year player Andrew Whitaker. If any, everybody remembers, I don't know. He was injured in the first preseason game last year, torn ACL. And mm-hmm. it's kind of a sucky thing to have uh, you work your way back all the way and then you get cut on the, on the basically first day at training camp. Um, Seahawks signed, this is one we can spend a little bit of time with. Seahawks signed safety Julian Love to a three-year, $36 million contract extension. He had one year left on his contract, $8 million cap hit in 2024. I would imagine that cap hit for 2024 went down a little bit with this new deal. Don't know the details completely yet, but um, it doesn't sound like they broke the bank to get a guy that's that's um, important to their defense, but they didn't overspend mm-hmm. the position. No, they didn't. And that, that's a, a deal that is, um, I don't know, it sounds a lot like you know, $12 million a year for safety, but if you look around the league, that's actually – for a guy that made the pro bowl um it, that's right online it's not like ooh a steal but it's also not like an outrageous payday um and he's important to what they do because of his ability to do lots of different things um mike mcdonald wants to be multiple he wants his safeties to be interchangeable and um you know sometimes be in the back and sometimes be up in the box and and julian love can do those things and so finding guys that can can be both um you know, play the the deep uh, zone, but also get up in the box and be physical and be a strong safety. It's important for this defense. And so getting him locked up um, doesn't hurt anything. And he's a he's still a young guy. So uh, it's a good move by John Snyder overall, I think. Yeah, and they, they had a few different signings too. They signed wide receiver Marcus Sims, another uh, UFL player um he had 23 receptions 426 yards kind of stretched the field a little bit as a player mm-hmm. um 18.5 led the league uh, uh on reception average 28.7 yards for kickoff return average as well so he's got that in his repertoire he can come in and um, add to the competition there uh returning kicks and then they signed offensive tackle uh now center Jalen Sundell undrafted this year out of North Dakota State, uh, All-American with 15 starts at left tackle there, um, but spent the previous three seasons with them as their starting center. So uh, mm-hmm. I understand that he's he's working out at center uh, as well uh, in camp. So Well, we'll I mean, they've only, had, they've only got two centers on the roster, and, you know, you got to have some, you know, someone to take those third, st- uh, third team snaps. So that wasn't surprising to see them make a move there. Um, Another move that they made on the offensive line was they basically traded out a tackle uh, for a guard, um, releasing Tremon Arkham Jr., um, whose fourth year spent some time with the Rams, actually was a starter for them a little bit, uh, and signed offensive tackle Ilm Manning. Um, He's a guy who went undrafted in 2023, and spent some time with San Francisco last year. Um, I guess in Arizona too. Um, 
And so he's now coming up to Seattle to give them some extra reps at tackle. Yeah. And, and one of the, before we get to, to kind of some of the injury talk, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second, I wanted to talk about an interesting player they brought in. Um, and, and everyone kind of knows this by now. It's been, you know, three days old news, but we haven't recorded the, this week. So it's new to us to, to talk about uh, Connor Williams, the mm -hmm. all pro level uh, offensive center um, with the Dolphins last year tore his ACL in December wasn't expected to return it was kind of one of those dicey things it, even his agent said it was not great um but he ended up passing a physical with the Seahawks and indicating that he is ready to go um not just for the first game but right now in camp if he was to be signed sounds like he came in they liked what they saw. They started negotiating a deal, and that's all we've heard. So mm -hmm. this, this kind of happened uh, Wednesday from Adam Schefter. Uh, we heard those kind of details, and it's been radio silent since. Not even sure if he's still in Seattle or if he's somewhere else, um, but they seem like they're trying to work out terms. Mm -hmm. But talk he's to me about with other teams. He's, yeah. Seattle's not the only team he's talking to. And that might be half something to do with part of the the slowness of this process as he wants to see, you know, where the money is. But um, there's kind of been this belief that he would resign with Miami um, once healthy. And if he's passed a physical for Seattle, that means he's healthy enough. And all of this might just be a play to basically tell Miami to, you know, let's get this done. Um, Schneider doesn't tend to be a part and play those games, but center isn't big enough of, of a worry. And this would be a big enough upgrade that maybe he's willing to like, okay, you know, if, if Miami drops the ball, then we'll be there to, to catch it and, um, type of situation. So he's just playing along. I don't know, but yeah, I mean, I, going into this off season, I would have been surprised if he p played for anyone other than Miami, but um, an opportunity to get a guy that plays at that level um, at a position where Seattle is nothing but question marks um, would be outstanding. And he played, you know, his first four seasons, he played left guard. And then he mm -hmm. transitioned with the uh, Dolphins in 2022 to offensive center, tore that ACL. And <clears throat> under normally under these situations, even with his all pro level, status i would be skeptical in signing him to more than one year like and, and kind of a prove it deal um maybe slightly better than that maybe an incentive laden deal maybe a mm -hmm. 3.5 million dollar base fully guaranteed plus another 3.5 in incentives that he could reach that gets him into the the range where he should should be and he would make that concession because he's signing so late in the process and he's coming off the ACL, and obviously teams kind of want to see. So really, in a, in a way, the Seahawks seem to have the leverage, but with him talking to multiple teams and being the player he is, he's actually the one that's got the leverage. And this may, in fact, we talked about this before we push record, this may could, could very well be a ploy by him and the Dolphins to kind of get his, um, get his salary established uh, get his price um, established in the market and then go back to Miami. Yeah. I mean, if he comes in um, and let's say he does sign with Seattle, like instantly, you know, he's the presumed starter. I, I get that of everyone course. likes Oluwatimi and, and wants to see what he can do, but we're talking about one of the better centers in the league. And so what does this tell you overall then about the status of the raw, not just the offensive line, but the status of the roster we're bringing in a player like this? I think they what they they look at and they see that this roster is better than the media thinks and closer and that they've got a they've got one significant hole and that's the interior of the offensive line and if they can well and really and and, and for right now right tackle but we'll get to that um, but it's the offensive line and if they can solidify the offensive line that this roster could be competitive um, and I don't mean competitive that's exactly like. Right you know, oh, we'll, we'll win a game here or there, but competitive, like, against the better teams in the league. Um, and Getting so the, the playoffs that, competitive. Yeah. 
get into the playoffs, like, maybe win, win a now. Game they're, they're in kind of win now mode. I'm not talking that they will win a ton of games this year, or they're going to go to the Super Bowl. Um, and and in fact, I you know I think that they're probably in a two year kind of a mm-hmm. master plan rebuild so that Mike McDonald gets his guys. Um, but that's going to take a minute. It doesn't happen in one off season. You can't solve every issue in in one off season. But I like this idea. Somebody that you can get without completely breaking the bank. He's not going to get uh, Ragnow money, you know, like mm-hmm. 13, 14 million dollars as an offensive center coming off an ACL like this. I think that, but getting him into that potential of being into the $7 million range, something like that makes a lot of sense, both for the player and the team, especially if he can, you know, play at a high level, comes back in. He's only 27 now. He'll be 28 when he gets to free agency in March. And Mm -hmm. then he can, he can have that nice yeah, three or four year contract um, while he's still under 30 years old. Yeah, actually, and that, <clears throat> that's a good point. Like he's young enough that um, this is a good time, you know, get that prove it deal, prove that he's still the same player after a major injury and then get paid next off season. Um, and, you know, that would work. I would, I mean, I'd love to see it um, because the interior, the offensive line is re- is that bad right now. Um and the the nice thing about it is is it really removes the dependency on a guy like Lakin Tomlinson because he's the veteran and he's like the you know supposed to be the stabilizing force and all that, but he hasn't been good for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And so if you can get another veteran, a, a guy that can can get in there and lead that, well, okay, now you can move some pieces around and not feel like you have to play Tomlinson. Um, also. If things just fall poorly at guard, you know, you can move this guy over and bring Oluwatimi in if you still think Oluwatimi is That's exactly um, right. Is the guy. And so he he could play left guard and, and Oluwatimi could play center and you could just get your best five out there in a different way. Um and so yeah, I kinda like kinda like that move. Um since we're on the topic of the offensive line, we should talk about Abe Lucas and Yeah, let's talk about some injury stuff. Because his knee is progressing, his, his, but he's not looking at being back anytime soon. So it's going to be at least a couple of weeks before, at, at the earliest that we can, you know, before he's um, out practicing and doing that kind of stuff. So that's a bit disappointing. Uh, just yeah, after you practice. See him, after practice. You want to see him out there, but yeah. After practice on Wednesday, McDonald was pretty noncommittal. Mm-hmm. on Abe Lucas and his injury time frame. He admitted that he hoped there would be more progress by now, which is something, you know, you don't want to hear out of a coach because if a coach is saying that, it's probably even more serious than it actually is um, or, or more serious than, than he's letting on. Um, and he couldn't really give a time frame. Said that um, other reports indicated that Lucas was practicing, um, was at practice, but... Mm-hmm. He uh, and he looked strong and he was walking without a limp and he was able to run full speed straight ahead. Um, but it's the that agility where you where yeah. you need um, him with to an be. ACL. It's 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 your your lateral um, mm-hmm. push off and, and, and strength in that way that you're waiting for that to return. And so, it, I mean, it's good that he's able to run and that he'll he means he's in shape cardiovascularly, like all of that when he gets cleared to play. Um there's not a there's not gonna be that ramp up um for him athletically, but if he's only running in straight lines, then he's still not close. And we don't know exactly yet what the procedure was. Yeah. Which I find interesting. Um so it could have been just a cleanup. It could have been, you know, something that, you know, he was feeling kind of a, a pain every time he, he did a certain movement and they cleaned that up. And it's still kind of bothering him. And maybe they had a, a, a second procedure that was undisclosed. We just don't have any idea. They don't mm-hmm. have any, uh, they don't have to tell us like what it was. Nope. Um, but um, we'll see. So originally before training camp began, the Seahawks, uh, the Seahawks uh, had 12 players placed on the pup list or the non-football injury list. Eight since then have passed their physicals. Jerome Baker. Tyrell Dodson, Lance Boykin, Anthony Bradford, Nehemiah Pritchett, DJ James, 
D. Williams, wide receiver D. Williams, and finally yesterday, linebacker um, Easton Gibbs. Past physicals are now able to practice with the team full speed, no both restrictions. In, both starting inside linebackers, which we were stressed about because they were both injured all mm-hmm. off season, all OTAs, all of that. Neither one of them did, could, you know, could play. They were both hurt, and they're supposed to be our two starters. And there's not any depth behind them. Um, with the exception of the fourth round rookie, and now suddenly they're both healthy and ready to go. So <laughs> it's funny um, how that works. Yeah, um, I feel a lot better <laughs> right now yeah. with both those two guys healthy. I do too. Yeah, I do too. And um, it's great to have both uh, Baker and Dodson, and then our new draft pick Tyrese Knight in there. Understand all three are looking great, moving around great, learning the the defense and progressing. Um, in addition to Abe Lucas, still not able to be out there and not pass physicals is Jarek Reed. His timeline is a little longer. Um, I would assume now based on everything that we're hearing and where we're at in training camp that he's probably going to start the year on IR. That would be my assumption. And we can kind of build roster mm-hmm. assumptions well, be a, based, based on that. It'll be a, it'll, it would be cause it, cause he's never practiced. Um, no, it would be, be the pup list, list um, which actually, is a little bit different. There's some, some, it's the rules are different, but yeah, it would, he's, I would agree. I think he's pup list. Uh, he would have to make major progress in order to be um, able to pass a physical before um, training camps over in order for um, him to get a, I, I just don't see that happening at this point, which is too bad because he's a guy that, that does fit what Mike McDonald wants to do with their safeties. And so it would be kind of fun to add, add him to the mix, but, um, but it'll yeah, getting him back after week spot. six is going to be a, uh, a, a problem either. You know what I mean? Like right. it would open up a spot. And if somebody does get hurt, well, you've got this guy sitting there waiting for week six to roll around to be eligible to come off the, the pup and, and join the team. So that would be kind of uh, useful as well. <clears throat> and when you go through the exercise of looking at the secondary, and you try to build a roster, it's hard. We're There's good cut players, players. That are gonna get cut. Yeah. And so having Jerick Reed on the on the um on the pup list and not starting on the fifty three with with kind of an unproven skill set. I mean he was out there a little bit last year before he got hurt, but nonetheless, um younger guy, it it's it gives another another opportunity for another player that is healthy to be able to come in and make the roster. Um, Drake Thomas and Cameron Young are the other two players to remain out. It sounds like Cameron Young, who's the defensive tackle they drafted last year, he's going to be ready to to come off that list sometime next week. Mm-hmm. So that's good news. And then Drake Thomas, no word, no indication of anything really. Um, and yeah, so I'm not sure. Yeah, he wasn't included in the him. updates. Um, yeah, which means nobody asked uh, the coach about him. So <laughs> right. uh, yeah, that that's actually kind of you know, frustrating because he's a guy that's fighting to just to make the roster, right? He's a um, a guy that you I would consider just off the bubble um, and hoping to play his way onto the bubble and then play his way from onto the bubble onto the roster. Um, and for him to not be out there at all, like that's, it, it it's hurts his ability to do those things. So we've spent the first 20 some odd minutes talking about all of the technical aspects of the roster and where players are at and and so forth. Let's talk about kind of what's going on on the field. So we've had two practices. Um, it's, it's fun. We've got new coaches. We're trying to fix the run defense. We've got a big competition on the offensive line. Um, other players are trying to learn the book, uh, the, the playbook, and trying to integrate that into uh, carrying that over full speed on the field um but they're still in uh no pads just kind of running around it's a lot of seven on seven drills things like that but i'm hearing that Geno smith looks amazing so far actually that's, um, that is that is one of the things that that stood out in both the first two practices were um that Geno smith is sharp he's hitting people um especially long passes um looking really good and sam Howell's struggling with accuracy right. um and yes. overthrowing and, guys, and underthrowing timing, guys. Yes. And right. any, like I read an article um, that was like, yeah, he's, you know, coming in, his 
plan is to you know turn this into a competition or whatever and like yeah well that seems like it's already over it's uh, over yeah it's over G- Gino Smith uh, you know from all accounts is completing like 90% of his passes now granted they're they're going to guys that don't have pads on and so forth but they are in coverage they are in sticky coverage uh, our defensive backs are trying to do the best job they can on guys like DK Metcalf and, and so forth and I want to talk about DK Metcalf as well because if there's another player that's completely just having a great session so far, DK Mm -hmm. Metcalf. Um, But yeah, it's kind of exciting to have the head of the, um, the spear, so to speak, Geno Smith, be the guy that comes in most ready for camp, not only physically, he worked out all off season, but accuracy wise, timing wise, learning a new uh, scheme, learning, learning new language, the whole thing, and then coming and executing it right away, making the right decisions, getting the ball out of his hand quickly, um, making throws that from what, from all indications are just spot on perfect, like in 10 inch windows, you know, yeah. over, over the top, um, 10 inch windows uh, and not, and not at eight yards. Um, right. it, we're talking about yeah, at, 40 at, yard at like, downfield. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hitting tiny little windows. I mean, that was a Russell Wilson, um, you know, trademark is tiny windows way down the field. And, and, um, you know, to see Gino kind of hitting those same tiny windows is is great to see. I mean, you're right. yeah. he he worked and not just physically, like mentally prepping as far as with the all the new terminology and everything to make sure that he was in full command of everything that was going on. Um, the guy put the work in and is ready. Yeah. And um, it's impressive, like to yeah, see him come is. in and do that. It's his job. Yeah. Now At everyone point, knows like, there's no what, there was there was never really a competition, um, but any idea that there might have become a competition is gone. It's Geno Smith's job. I will say this, you know, wh- wh- however you feel about Geno Smith, listeners, um, it, it, we all get the idea that he's kind of a bridge quarterback, um, and that but but. Well, having said that, this is his season. Like, it's not mm-hmm. Sam Howell's. It's going to be his season. He's the quarterback. Um, I think that the at, as time goes on and at, at the at the level of work that he's put in, the coaches are have gained confidence in him to be not only this year's starter, but potentially, the, you know, 2025, 2026, um, as they find out a longer-term solution for that position, which is, infinitely hard to do in the NFL. You either get very, very lucky, Brock Purdy, or you draft in the first three picks of the draft. And, um, yeah, and even then there's no guarantee. There's no guarantees. Zach Wilson. Uh, <laughs> there's no guarantee. Yeah, right. So um, it's it's good to have that part figured out, and it's good to know that the, the, the leadership that we have at that position going into this season, given, given all the other um, things that, that could happen. Um, it, it, you have that steady, sh- uh, ship at the, at the, at the helm. Um, DK Metcalf. So from all indications, DK Metcalf is having the best camp out of any player on the roster. Like he's, he came in business-like. He hasn't said too many words. He comes in, he does his work. He makes the catches, sometimes spectacularly contested catches. He's working hard, leading by example, um, catches, all over yeah. the field. They're they're moving him all over the field, like he's not just running see. the same go routes. You know, they're yeah. using him underneath slants, bubble screens, everything that cr- they can. A do. lot more creative uh, use of how to use your most athletic player, which yeah. rubs should a lot not of stuff have, to get him open. Should not have been uh so hard to get the team to decide to do that instead of just sticking him out there and saying here go win one on one and we're not going to do anything to help you um which i mean he's good enough to do record setting seasons aside but imagine what a little bit of of designed help would do for a guy of of his caliber um he's other teams do it i, I mean, know you know what i mean it's not it's not like um xyz receiver from a given team is a pro bowler or all pro level without a little bit of help on his from a scheme standpoint 
So um, I, I think that TK Metcalf does need help. Like he's double teamed. He's the mm-hmm. focal point of any team's defense. Yeah. And when you have that level of scrutiny on you, it's hard to execute in the NFL. It just is. And, and he does an amazing job regardless of, of that. But you scheme him now a little bit better. You give Gino a, more opportunity to get him the ball in open space. And all of a sudden, the, the dynamic player that is there for Metcalf that we've always known is there that shows up in these little teeny um, glimpses now is a more pronounced part of his game. And it makes the offense scary. Oh, yeah. Because it's not only DK Metcalf you're doing that with. You're doing that with Njigba. You're, you've got Lockett now who's kind of in, in towards the end of his career and not the beginning. Um, could use some help too. Like getting open, getting uh, freed up to, um, to have some space. He's probably lost a step at this point, but he's also a very intelligent um, um, route runner. And so I think it's just, it, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and, and also seeing what the back end of that wide receiver room looks like as well um, to kind of supplement those three guys. Yeah. I mean, wide receiver is one of the more interesting positions, both because of the just high end talent, but also the depth and the, and, and the battle. Um, it was funny. Like we put together uh, 53 man rosters for a show that I ended up not go, being on. Um, but I, in order to keep all the defensive backs I wanted, I ended up shifting an offensive player for a defensive player trading out uh, within the depth. And I still kept six receivers and wanted to keep a seventh. Um, The talent's there. It's just, it's a fun group. Well, that, since you did that exercise, um, I don't know if you have that handy, um, but it'd be kind of fun to go through our, our rosters together because I, I did the same thing. I mean, I kept six wide receivers on my roster. Uh, the last two, Jake Bobo was my fourth. Mm-hmm. LaVisca Chenault was my fifth. And I kept mm-hmm. Derek Young. And I understand Derek Young is looking amazing this, this offseason. And I will say this, and, and in the show that we did on Hawks Rundown um, podcast um, that, I, that I was on, uh, we didn't even mention at all the word. Well, I mentioned it because we didn't mention it. Um, Dwayne Eskridge. Um, yeah. But I understand from m- multiple sources that multiple players are choosing to talk about D. Eskridge as a player that they've seen work his ass off, like works really hard, shows up, making plays, doing the little things in the offseason to kind of get ready. So it wouldn't surprise me if D. Eskridge shows up in camp and makes some plays. Uh, it, it's, it's one of those things we, we kind of almost don't talk about them because you just, it, it only makes it worse. <laughs> can he, can <laughs> you know? he string first before I, I consider him, he has to string together at least two weeks of practices where he's on the field. Yeah. Yeah. And I not, would say an entire off season, like two weeks well, is not going to do him any good to make this. No, awesome. but I mean, he needs to it, have as far as, full off as far as like, before I start even considering him. Mm-hmm. as a guy that when we start looking forward to make a roster, he has to have, because he's never had that in any of his years in the NFL. He's never put together two full weeks of training camp. Um, he'll like miss a day here, miss a day there. He's never been able to string together two full weeks. So we'll see. Uh, and I, that's why I didn't have him on my roster, but you're, yeah, I had the same I group. Didn't either. Uh, I had the same group. A lot of, um, you know, uh, Derek Young is so interesting because of his speed and his size and, and all of that. Yes. And, you know, the fact that the old coaching staff wanted to use him as a tight end and an H back and a full back and, and a wide receiver and move him around. Like clearly they saw something special, um, that was worth getting on the field. Yeah, he's um, fast. He's oh fast. yeah. He's got tremendous speed. So, um, so yeah, yeah we'll so see. to me it, it was it was there, but yeah, it was hard because you look at that and you go, well, there's also, you know, th- there's there's got to be room for you know some of these young undrafted kids to to make a roster. You can't just automatically put them in pen as the in the cut list. Um, but I couldn't make room 
for anybody because I needed the extra roster spot on the defensive side. Yeah, this 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 is kind of an interesting year because everyone's talking about the the 49ers having a really good roster about the depth and and so forth and and every other team except for the Seahawks, right? There's a lot of predictions out there for the Seahawks to have a bad season. Mm. 7 wins is their upside. Um I, I disagree with that, but we, that's a yeah. That's it's an ESPN prediction of five wins <laughs> and the number two overall pick in the draft. But uh, and that's ridiculous, by the way. If you I look at so. this roster; there's no way you could come to that conclusion. Um, this roster is pretty good. Now, when I did this exercise for this for the other show, I did um, I did it straight away. I just I did 25 on offense, 25 on defense, three specialists. And so that that I wouldn't get tied into favoritism on, on either side of the ball because there's so many players that you could want to save that are on the periphery on the bubble, including a couple of draft picks, like three or four draft picks were in jeopardy for me. Mm-hmm. Um, which is which is kind of crazy. No undrafted players, I think, made my roster. Um and so it, it's tough. So I just kind of did things fairly straight away. I had two quarterbacks. I had four running backs. I had three tight ends. I had six wide receivers, a mm-hmm. couple of centers, and then 10 offensive linemen, I think. You had 10 offensive. I had nine offensive linemen. Um, Which is and, hard to do because, you know. Yeah. What, well, do you, what did you of, do with, like, uh, Part Lumea? of it is I had, I had Abe Lucas um, on the pup list. Okay. That makes it easier. Yeah. So um, I, if he's going to get that close to the season without having practiced, yeah, I don't know. You I, might as I well give him an extra four week. Yep. To at you know, least get his, plus plus two to come back. Yep. Get it in order to just be a hundred percent. I agree. So, I totally agree. I think that that's really important. I think if they push him out there at ninety two percent, that's a mistake. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just asking for trouble. I think. And that would really be very disappointing to me, not only for Abe, but for the team and for the coaches that made that decision. That would be awful. That would be a bad look. Um, he needs to be 100% healthy. And if he never is, then he never plays again. That sucks. But at least he's got the ability to walk as a human being, um, which is really important. Mm-hmm. Um. You want to talk about the roster really quick and the and the fifty three kind of an early early projection. Well, I mean, look, you kind of uh, I've laid it out, and I think most people can can pencil in the names, right? It's it's uh, Gino and Hallett quarterback. It's um, Walker Charbonnet McIntosh at running back. Who do you have as your fourth? I did have Ricky Person Person yeah. as my fourth, but it could be Halani. I guess Halani looked really 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 good. Coming yeah, in. I originally had Pearson thought about Halani, and then I was like, eh, it'll be one or the other, but there won't be a mm-hmm. fifth. Um, you know, the three. It might even ends. be three. They might even keep one of those two on the practice squad and only have three on the active and make yeah. have another roster spot for another position. Yeah. And so then, you know, we already mentioned the wide receivers, the three tight ends being um, uh, Fant. Um, Barner, the rookie, and um, Pharaoh Cooper. Uh, no, Pharaoh Brown. Pharaoh Brown. Uh, um, you know, Bryce from the other show that we that I did um, the other day, he made an argument for Jack Westover as a player that can play fullback, he can block, he can receive the ball, um, and, and worked a way to work him on the roster as a fourth tight end, but also you know, kind of a specialist kind of a guy. Um, and the, he only kept three running backs on the roster to do that. Yeah, that would make sense. Um, you know, both centers that are currently, I've got them. Um, you know, I went with Fant at tackle and um, Fant cross. Um, right, the uh, Olotimi at, at center and the guards being... Um, Tomlinson uh, and Haynes, Haynes and, and Tomlinson. So there's my starters. And then for backups, right. Um, you know, you go like that, that's where it got a little like weird in that. I'm like, mm-hmm. Okay. So you got, um, Anthony Bradford, who's going to make this team. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and then Curtis. Yeah, Curtis is good. This was before I had I knew that they were working out Curtis both at guard and tackle, and that he took um, tackle reps with the ones for a day um, at right tackle, which I thought was interesting. But yeah, so Brad Bradford Curtis, um, and but you need another tackle. Yeah, you do. I had Ra- Raquan O'Neal on my list, but that was just because of the lack of yeah uh, like options. We, but that now was McClendon the hard Curtis part. is taking snaps there, so maybe yeah. But he's not he's not a left tackle, so unless you're expecting Fant to swing over if something happens to cross, and so you're gonna go with Fant and Curtis as your two tackles in that. Or if case. somehow Michael Jera Gerald is ready. Um, yeah, he was the sixth um, round pick this this year, but. I don't he was think a he earns an automatic nod on this no. roster. He's a project. He's probably a guy that could get to the practice squad without much uh, challenge. So that's why I, I figured he was off. I almost was like, you know, you may, if if um, Lucas isn't healthy and has to start the year on the pup, they almost need to go get another tackle, a swing tackle. Um, because Fant, the guy you signed to be your swing tackle, is now a starter. Um. But that was hard. But yeah, so you end up with nine. So Stone Forsyth is still on the roster. Okay. I mean, that's the that's the worst possible case scenario for a swing tackle that remains on the roster. But maybe that's what happens for the first three week, three or four weeks until Lucas comes. Yeah. Back. And I think his name was the one that I penciled in there. But I was like, I hope there's someone else. Well, that's um, why I put Rick on O'Neill, only because I don't know too much about O'Neill other than they thought highly of him enough last year to keep him on the roster all year. Mm-hmm. Um. The other name is Satoa Luea. Um, what do you do with him? He's not he's not a tackle. He's a guard. But you've already he's got your guard. guards plus a backup. And you've only got so many spots on your roster. Well, yeah. And you've got guys like um, Curtis who have and, more value because they're, they're at other positions. Um, unless he makes that transition to center so he can provide... Um, multiple backup positions i've got him as a practice squad guy which is i didn't like that i don't think he Uh, makes it i think that he's got the susceptibility of of like uh, last year raekwon o'neill and mcclendon curtis we picked up after the first week um, mm -hmm. and they stayed on the roster all year we picked those guys off practice squads i think lumea has got that kind of a risk to put him look other another team is going to go get him (laughs) Yeah, because he's a nice up and coming talent. We just don't have room for him on the roster. It doesn't mean he's a bad player. Um, the other and the, and the thing that I'm questioning too on your roster is you don't have him on there, and you put Lucas on the um, unable to perform list. And so even without Lucas on the roster, he doesn't make the roster. So I'm a little concerned about his ability to to show out in camp and find a spot. Well, and part of it is just. It- I was, I needed, I was trying to get our, it, it became a balance on, on, do I get the extra offensive lineman who probably won't play because he's fifth on the depth chart at guard? Yes. Or do I bring, do I keep a defensive back, which I think I can't get through to the practice squad? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's talk about that. Let's, let's switch our, uh, switch over to defense really quick. So I'll just do mine really quick, and you can tell me where you differ. Uh, defensive line, Byron Murphy, Leonard Williams, Dre Jones, Mike Morris, Jerron Reed, Cameron Young, Jonathan Hankins. All those okay. guys make it. Yeah. Uh, linebacker, outside uh, edge guys, Uchen and Owasu, Boy Mafe, Derek Hall, Daryl Taylor. Okay. For now. Daryl Taylor for now. We can talk about Daryl Taylor because he's kind of a bubble guy. Inside uh, guys, Tyrell Dodson, Jerome Baker, John Radigan, Tyrese Knight. Okay. Safety. And Patrick O'Connell instead of John Radigan, but whatever. That's okay. just a, that's just a, he's a, he's uh, got another year of team control. There wasn't any particular reason. I had um, O'Connell going on my practice squad, so we still had team control. Hmm. Maybe. Unless somebody picked him up. Safety, well, just, Rashawn yeah. Jenkins. Uh, Julian Love, Kevon Wallace, Jonathan Sutherland was my fourth safety. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, so that I mean, comes it really into comes play down. Here in a, that comes into play here in a second when we talk it about comes corners because Kobe Bryant is gone. It, yeah, it comes in roster. either with Sutherland 
or Bryant. And um, I, I went with Sutherland too. And I, I didn't feel great about it, but I did it. Yeah. The only pause I have about putting Sutherland on my roster is that he's somewhat a unique player. And I'm not sure yet how multiple he is. Yeah. If he turns out that he can play a, a little bit of free safety in a spot, if he can, if he's okay in coverage, if he comes down into the box, we already know he can do that. Um, he maybe he gets the nod. Now Kobe Bryant, we already know he's multiple. He can play at corner. He can play slot. He can play, you know, in the nickel. He can I mean, play he can't, a little. He can do those you. things, but can he do any of them well enough to to warn and, a roster? And spot? that's the question that needs to be answered in this camp. Yeah, for sure. I don't want to write him off. Uh, mm -hmm. I was asked to do an initial 53, and so this is my initial. Um, corner, Devin Witherspoon, and I kept six. Witherspoon, mm -hmm. Woolen, Brown, Michael Jackson, Pritchett, and Artie Burns, actually. I did not keep DJ James. I also did not uh, keep DJ James. Um, did you say, you said Trey Brown? I said Trey Brown and Artie Burns. Okay. Michael yeah. Jackson you had well. Artie Burns. Um, yeah. interesting. He played so well last year and they just don't yeah. have a lot of veteran presence on the back end of this defense. We've got Julian Love now and Jenkins, but that that's, that's it. Yeah. Um, so, so I went in and, and what, what's different between mine and yours is I kept another, um, well at the time I didn't realize that Jarek Reed was going to be out for as long as he is. Um, and so he was on my, um, he was on my 53. Gotcha. And so Who, really it was a case of, um, I had Jarek Reed on the roster and you had Abe Lucas on the roster. So you had 24 offensive players and 26 yep. defensive players. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Man, I just played it straight up on this roster. Now I could definitely change last year. We had, we did 24, 26. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But there will be guys on the bubble. I mean, guys like there Easton are. Gibbs that everyone really raves about right now is, is not making this team. Matt Gotell. Um, Matt Gotell was a Adams. hard one. That was a hard one for me to leave off. Yeah. Um, just simply because the team needs a nose tackle. Um, and you've got Jonathan Hankins, you've got Cameron Young, who's, who's, um, going to be back. He, he, he is, um, out, but, but close. Um, it may come down like, to Cameron Young and Matt Gotell, and one of those two could then come onto the practice squad. But I don't know if Cameron Young would hang around. Yeah, I don't think Cameron Young would would get picked off. He'd get picked off in a second. But I see Matt Gotell, you know, reverting to the practice squad. You think he can get through? Cats. I think I think he could get through. It would it. It's not a guarantee, but I think he could get through. And I, and I cut Miles Adams, and and there's a guy that kind of played a rotation role for the Seahawks, not well yeah. in my opinion in the last mm -hmm. three years, and he's back, and and I think the roster is now has the ability to move on from Miles Adams. For me, it came down. It was Miles Adams or Mike Morris, and Mike Morris has more upside and yeah, um, totally, and knows the uh, knows McDonald because they were at Michigan at the same time. So what do so, you do with Daryl Taylor? You've got Nelson Caesar out there that might push. We don't know too much about uh, Anu uh, Jogo, um, but Daryl Taylor's there for now as a fourth rush linebacker. Yeah, um, I have him on my roster. I don't think you can not. Um, granted, he's more of a specialist than the others. He's more of a, um, a guy that needs to be moving forward. Um I had to say that Derek Hall was the standout player from day one of the of camp, um, yes. getting a couple sacks, just abusing. I uh, heard some tackles. from another source too that his legs look amazing and that he is, um, yeah, he ran over a bull nose, a bull rush to tackle, um, and ran around who, another who, one. Who was it? Was it? I'm going to try to figure out the name. It was one of the guys that, um, was it, I think it was, like uh, Gerald or something, something like Jarrett Greenfield was Greenfield. who it was. Yeah. I just ran him over, knocked him on his butt. Um, and then ran around, um, and just 
uh, it was Max Pritcher, just as if he wasn't there. Straight yeah. line to straight line to the to the quarterback. Um, I heard Boy and Mafe did that to Charles Cross yesterday in practice. Hmm. Just just under just ran uh, around him and under him, like dipped his you know dipped his shoulder, got low, got under his arm. Yeah, yeah, you get under you get under their arm as a um, defensive end, and that's an instant win. You're done. Um, but yeah, so um, Hall looks great, and he can drop back into coverage and do other things. He's just because he's such and a good he can athlete. Play the run. He can defend the run. Yeah, so I could like he seems to be settled in as the third guy, um, and then you've got. Uh, Daryl Taylor, who's more of a specialist, but I look at all this and I go, well, who's going to push him off the roster? Not right now. Right. There's nobody, maybe Nelson Caesar, but Nelson Caesar's undersized. And I mean, really a just completely different player than Daryl Taylor. The, the one thing that's going to hold Daryl Taylor back with this new regime, if he's up to his old habits would be his abil- inability to defend the run um, yeah. and go, drop back into coverage. Those yeah, are liabilities not, for him. He is. He's a guy that that gets upfield and gets after the quarterback really well, but this, doesn't though. do much else. I will say this, and I'm not going to completely write him off on those two things I just mentioned, because I don't know how well our coaching staff was coaching him now yeah. at this point. Um, based on last year, if it was just last year, you got to give the kid a pass. Like last year, it was awful, I thought, the coaching. Yeah. And um, I want to see what he does in this in this scheme with these coaches with Arde. I want to see what Arde can get out of him because if his defensive line coach, defensive coordinator, can make him a special player, which I think Daryl Taylor has that ability. I mean, the kid's got had nine and a half sacks. Um, he had nine and a half year. sacks in ten games um, because he didn't do anything in the first um chunk of games and then got some stuff turned around and and got not, ended up with nine and a half sacks on the end of the year um tied with uh Uchenna Nuasu for the um the team lead not last year but the year before mm-hmm. uh, he's got the ability to get to the quarterback if that's how they're going to use him um Can when they pick start... up the skills does he have this does he have the physical ability to drop back in coverage does he have the physical ability to tackle and set an edge. I would argue, yes. He's a big see, guy. He's like 265. The coverage He's part's also, gonna, gonna be a, always going to be a struggle for him. But his ability to play the run and set the edge, absolutely. He is a 4-3 defensive end and would be a very good one in a 4-3 defense. He was drafted to be a 4-3 defensive end and then yes, they changed was. the scheme on him. And yes. now he's a 3-4 outside linebacker, which he's not really the body type for um but okay you can have a liability in one area and not be like i can't really have him drop back in coverage so if it's passing play we need him moving forward but the fact that he struggled so hard so hard to, to um fill his run responsibilities um two years ago until they took him away from him um makes me just really wonder about you know his fit in the scheme and i i still think he is a three four defensive end and they need to four, they, three. yeah sorry he's a four three defensive end and um he has more value to someone else than he does to seattle just for because of scheme so that's why i wanted to talk to you a little bit about the bubble situation with him because i've got him on my roster you've got him on yours i think the seahawks probably have him on theirs but there is a chance that something like that happens where they flip him for a player they need rather than a player that's a luxury player and only if they they, um but who will replace well i mean i was going to talk to you about that um so from my understanding dre jones is taking like 80 percent reps as an outside linebacker in this defense so far and he's moving inside you know mm-hmm. on certain certain downs and you know scheming around and so forth but dre jones they're moving him seems over, to yeah. be the guy that would take up those snaps and, See, he, and they're gonna... not huge snaps you've still got a mm-hmm. nuasu 
you've got Moffitt, you've got Hall. We're talking about maybe 20, 25% of the snaps. And he's going to have similar issues to, um, to, uh, to Taylor in, in terms of uh, his ability to drop back into coverage. I mean, yeah. he's a defensive end. He's not yes. like, he's, he's, he's big. Like three, he's a bigger guy. Four. He's like three. He's, and he's, he's like 378 three, or sorry, yeah. 278. Two, yeah. Three, two, eight. Um, but yeah, so yeah. he's an even, he's an even bigger guy, but he does play the run better. Um, than we've ever seen from, uh, Daryl Taylor. And we know he can get after the quarterback. And I think they're using him there so they can move him around. Yes. Um, and he's going Just to, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's going to be a guy that can, can move around, but still come, still be See, going the, forward the, at the quarterback. And still have the best players on the field. So that's the key. It's like, okay, how do I get, uh, how do I have Jaron Reed, Jonathan Hankins, or, or, or one of those guys, Jaron Reed, Byron Murphy and Leonard Williams, Dre Jones and Leonard Williams on the field all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Plus Uchen and Owasu, boy, I'm off So maybe you don't, maybe you move Dre Jones over. Maybe Nuasu goes off the field or Mafe or one of the two. And then they, they're still stout in the middle, but, but can get to the quarterback. I mean, there's going to be certain schemes where you're, you're going to use that lineup. Not all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So interesting. So, Daryl Taylor could be a player that you could get value for. Um, so I whether think so. it's a fourth round pick, maybe if somebody flipped a fourth round pick, would you take it? Uh, maybe. Um, certainly a third. Absolutely. Um, a third. And then would you take a player? Would you take a swing tackle for Daryl Taylor? Depends on the swing tackle. Um, not really. No. Like an adequate, you know, replacement level. It'd be equal value for a team. Like, you know, Daryl Taylor's not going to be your premier guy, but he can play. Um, yeah. You'd get the equivalent type of a level player, I would think. Yeah. Like, um, if you're trading him for another Stone Forsyth, don't. Right. But if it was George Fant? I don't know. I'm, to me, Daryl Taylor just has more value. Um, Pass yeah, as a defensive so player in that key position, sure. Um, but yeah, but maybe you get Daryl. Maybe it's like a George Fant level tackle, who's um, three years younger, plus, um, or four plus, years younger, plus a, a low end draft pick, like a you know conditional. Six. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would probably do that, especially because I don't you know, think it's going to hurt if Daryl Taylor's off this roster. No, especially if a guy like Sonny Anderson suddenly shows up. Mm-hmm. Like, that would be cool. Um, anything else? No. Um, I, like, this is just a, this is a fun time of year. Can't wait till they get pads on. That'll be even more fun. Um, yeah. Right. In the, in the first game. Yeah. Yeah. Super fun. Yeah, I'm going to actually be up in Seattle for the second game. I'm not, the second game is not in Seattle, but I'm going to be up there. I'm going to be, we're, we're seeing some friends. We're going to a uh, uh, Foo Fighters concert. And, um, yeah, at, at uh, Safeco. So I'll, we're going to, we're all going. There's like 20 people or something. We're all going to a sports, sports bar to watch the game on Saturday cool. night. It'll be fun. Um, yeah, no, fun time of the year. It's it's good to have the practices going um, and and get closer to September um, when they when they start this thing. We're gonna have, um, come back here, you know, a couple times a week now, getting ready for the season. Um, I'm gonna miss the first two games of the season. I'm gonna be out of the country. Keith's gonna kind of take over, and I may find a way to figure out how to get on and. Uh, from where I'm at and it'll be a timing issue for me. It might be three in the morning. I have no idea. <laughs> we'll have to figure it out, but um, yeah, it'll be fun. So until next time, I think uh, we're, we'll come back early next week and we'll have another report. I'm sure there'll be th- some updates that we'll want to talk about. Absolutely. You can find Keith on Twitter at Myers NFL. You can find me at NW Seahawk. The show is Seahawks playbook podcast. Find us on your favorite podcast platform and our YouTube channel and um, hit that subscribe button, please. That would be great. So until next time, go Hawks.
Go Hawks. Seahawks Playbook Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Bill is at NW Seahawk, Keith is at Myers NFL, and the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.